Kia ora katou, nā mai, hari mai. Uh, welcome to uh, today's um, live session from EHF. And uh, today we've got uh, two guests. We're going to have Oliver Bruce, um, one of our C3 cohorts uh, from the fellowship. And he is a Kiwi investor and he does lots of amazing things. And you are going to have a great session today. I will let Oliver take over the session, but just a few housekeeping things. Um, we are recording. So the session is um, uh, going to be on our website if you want to watch it afterwards. And I think Oliver will take you through how he wants to do questions and Q&A through this, but it is a live session that we want people to have interaction with. So Oliver, over to you. Awesome. Um, and thanks, Michelle. Um, hey, everyone. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm stoked uh, to, to be able to do this with you all today because uh, the story that I think we're about to hear is one of the coolest stories that I've heard in New Zealand. Um, and when I first heard it, I was like, we've got to work out how to um, have this told. So I'm really glad that um, EHF was able to provide us with the platform to be able to tell the story. And I think this is a really good group um, to hear it. Um, yeah, look, I mean, just a little bit of context on me, C3 uh, work in predominantly in, in micromobility, electric bikes and scooters, but I do crypto as well. And so that's where I kind of came to this world um, through a couple of connections. I just want to thank uh, Stefan for, for making some initial connections, which got me to John, which got me to David. So um, thank you. Great to have you on. Um, excellent. Well, hey, David, I, I would, I'm really looking forward to this conversation. I, I feel like in some ways what we should do is just start right um, at the kind of very, at very top line level. Like, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and then also Vivi and where you're at at this stage? With okay. business? Cool. Hi, guys. Thanks for having me on. So, yeah, good morning, wherever you guys are. Uh, my name's David, uh, co-founder and CEO of Vivi. Uh, basically, we are a e-commerce platform home to premium NFT digital collectibles. Uh, we give users easy access to digital collectible in the palm of their hand through a mobile device. Vivi offers an end-to-end -end solution and the journey allows that users to come participate in a fandom. We believe that everyone's a fan of something, you know, whether if it's an action hero from a movie or a superhero from your favorite comic, and the NFT collectibles are designed to be like a physical collectible. Uh, they are available all in 3D and can be bought alive through the augmented reality function on your phone. And where users now can take photo and share amongst their favorite social media. And when you are missing out that collectible, uh, you can navigate through our secondary marketplace to help you to complete that set. Excellent. So and, and for anybody who hasn't gone and checked it out, you can download the VV app on the App Store, sign up, get an account and go on and have a look and see what's available. But David, like, you know, the, the people that you, well, the, the, the sort of, the things that you have on that store kind of blew me away because it wasn't just, you know, I think the thing, the story with NFTs to date has really been this like, ah, it's CryptoPunks and it's all these other things where nobody really knows who the artists are that much. I think it's now coming into the mainstream where you're starting to see a lot of bigger artists starting to get into the NFTs. But the thing that blew me away was just the, you know, who you had on. So do you want to just talk through the kind of the licensing that you have specifically? Yeah, so we started this business about four and a half years ago. Uh, I mean, I'm sure we're going to be talking a lot of main points in that, but touching base and the licensing uh, really started that process about three and a half years ago. And, you know, companies that we have on board that we can mention, you know, which is available. We have likes like Marvel, DC, Warner Brothers, uh, Sony, Universal, Firecom, uh, you know, Capcom, a lot of gaming company, and a lot of secondary tier of studio. Pretty much we capture a lot of these IP owners in, in the business of fandom and producing these superhero entertainment and bringing them all into one app is basically what our goal was. And what mm -hmm. we really wanted to do was to produce a premium app where all these, you know, digital collectible will be living in one. Awesome. And so, okay, because the thing that blew me away was when you started talking to me about like how these different things have been doing. So you sold how many DeLoreans and how long? We did about 87,500 DeLorean. And I think that was sold within a couple hours. We generate, I think that 
Pacific series was about six million dollars US in revenue. Uh, yeah. that was quite exceptional. Um, certainly, you know, the NFT had it's really living up. And you know, ever since we still see the growth still continue to, you know, thrive. Totally. And to give context to everybody else, when I'm saying the DeLorean, what I mean is the Back to the Future DeLorean from the movie, they sold digital models and different sizes and they sold out in a couple of hours and it was about $6 million worth of stuff. And and I, I see that you've like you've just launched, obviously, Spider-Man and then you've got the Mighty Marvel series and all these sort of things. So you've got, um, you know, the, the, some of the largest brands that I can see on board coming uh, to work with you. And I just... The thing that kind of blew me away is like there's a little company in New Zealand that somehow managed to end up with the NFT rights to all of these major global brands. And I that's the part of the story that I really want to unpack today. So can you take me through, like, what was your background? How did you even get into this? Yeah, so uh, I grew up in Auckland, North Shore. Um, you know, when I left school, I started up my own uh, retail shop called Fagabond Games. So for those of you know, you know, uh, we, we do all the board games, the Pokemon card, the Magic, the Gathering, the Warhammer, pretty much back in 97, we put people think is the, you know, the super nerdy star. And that business has been thriving. It still continue after 25 years. Um, I now have stores overseas and distribution business in different parts of Asia, all to do with gaming and retail. So I come from very strong IP background in terms of dealing with these intellectual properties and understanding what makes a collector really want to have that ownership. I mean, four and a half years ago, me and my co-founder, we started understanding this blockchain thing. Um, and this all really came about from one of my general manager and one of my gaming company introduced me into this blockchain technology and that's where all this brainstorming comes in and, you know, where we are today. And so, like, the part, <laughs> I'm trying to work out as you go, how did you actually get some licenses? Because you turn up to some of these uh, places, you, you, you talk up, you're going and talk to Marvel, or you're going to talk to DC or whoever, you know, Warner Brothers, whoever it is. And you're some random Kiwi guy who owns some gaming shops. Like, can you tell me that, what, like, what? that conversation was like? How did you even get the intro in the first place? And then- Yeah, kind of so, um, <clears throat> you know, a, a major part of our success today in adoption, as you mentioned, is all about licensing. Uh, yeah. And I, 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 I caught up, I think it's about 2017, around mid or end of 2017, I was up in Hong Kong or 2018 beginning. And I caught up with a very old friend of mine um, who is, uh, by a gentleman called Al Khan, uh, very well-known uh, individual, outstanding, being in the licensing business all his life, bought some of the most fantastic brands into the global launch, in, especially into the US. Um, you know, Al's responsible putting like Pokemon on air in the US through his four kids uh, entertainment. So I, I saw him in Hong Kong and I was trying to sell him the idea that, you know, I really do believe that one day this e-commerce, what we call this digital commerce business is going to rise. And, you know, our idea is to try to get as much brand and license involved. Now, just so everyone understands the context of this, three and a half years ago, when you walk into a ballroom or a meeting and you start using the word non-fungible tokens or NFT, people just think, number one, you're super nerd. Number two is they don't actually believe that the product will ever be, you know, have a demand for this. Uh, we, we had a pretty good early start with some smaller secondary brand IP, and that really kind of able to give us some sort of proof of concept of artwork, what the product will look like, how we engineer so we will keep continue to turn up and try to get a booking into these large studio for a meeting. Um, but let me let me tell you, it, it was extraordinary, extremely difficult. Uh, number one is people don't believe in it. Uh, number two is the minute they heard it's a blockchain, they pretty much think it's a scam or they think it's a Bitcoin or something. Um, you know, but we really demonstrate 
as a Kiwi, every time we go back to these studios, we we show them something new and something that really moving ahead, regardless if they're going to come on or not. But we really wanted to showcase and have the opportunity to let them understand how they could look at monetizing the IP they have through these digital uh, rounds. Um, so a lot of these IP that we have recently announced, like uh, Marvel Partnership, these partnership has not just really begun like two, three months ago when the hype of NFTs around. It was really being worked on for a number of years and, and some of them are multiple years uh, in, in the relationship to or to where we are today. Um, it, but certainly uh, it, it's a learning curve, um, you know, because as you say, Oliver, we just, nobody in, in New Zealand, we're pre-revenue, we're a startup, um, you know, we have very small funds. Um, we don't fit your average, uh, life, you know, major IP studios uh, target area to work with. Yeah. And so when you, uh, so the, the contracts that you typically signed, are they, are they licensed agreements? You're typically, lock, you've got some level of exclusivity for some period of time? Yeah. Um, I mean, a couple of things. Uh, no, number one, most important thing is that all these brands and all these IP house, they do understand their brain power and they do understand the, you, you certainly don't want to be overusing that and overexposing that. So Generally, when you give someone the rights to use that Pacific image, appear in, you know, on, on a species digital, you will not want it to be reproduced again and again because that brings out, you know, the collectability basically fizzles away. Um, so everything we do are very limited. We, we mint X amount and they sell out and that's it. Basically, the secondary market takes it away, just like you would in a physical world when you license, you know, some physical final toys, you put a limited edition on it. Once you sell out, the idea is that you, you don't reproduce it. So to keep that collectors, um, you know, happy. Yeah. Um, and for folks, just to give, give you a kind of a bit of context on this. So I, I, I wanted to uh, understand how this works. So I went into VB and I bought Spider-Man and this is Spider-Man in my lounge. Um, so you can see like, this is, this is the sort of thing that you end up buying as a, as a, um, it's not a great image, but yeah, in here the, the, um, the, you know, you can go and purchase one of these things and it shows up and you, you, you're able to kind of place it into your rooms and people are building whole collections of these things. And the Spider-Man one in particular came out with five different editions and people got really excited about buying all five. And I was not so excited. I bought the one, you know, most common. Uh, version, but maybe there will be resale value at some point if, uh, if, if it does come out. Um, so, I mean, David, that, that's a real, it's a really useful context. I think uh, for me, certainly, I didn't understand the collectibles business per se. You know, I just sort of like, oh, yeah, cool. I figured that there's something cool there. But the folks who buy these things own them, right? And so that's the sort of, you, you actually are owning something. Obviously, it's licensed from Marvel to you. You now own it. It's yours. You can sell it. Uh, 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 yeah, pretty much that's correct. And yeah. what you had there was the first appearance of Spider-Man. And on, on top of that is the first Marvel NFT. Um, and I think that Pacific Spider-Man you got as a common is, yes. we, we call it common because we mint a little bit more so everyone can have something. Um, you, you, if, if you, you know, we can talk about a little bit how we release these product and why we have these different scarcity but one of the key aspects is to ensure that the fans have an opportunity to own one. Um, and then we do the animated and we have an interactive one where you tap the screen, it does the jump, it does the spider web, and that's a secret rare, um, yep. which is much lower mint number. Yeah. And and so just so I can give context on this as well. So when can you can you give the numbers on what the Spider-Man uh, sales were? Yeah, um, and, and to be very honest, the, the beauty about our app and the blockchain is that everything is, you know, uh, transparent. I mean, <laughs> yeah. work it out by just going online. Now, we did about 60,000 Spider-Man, and we, we bought them in five different levels from the commons, uh, the uncommon, the rare, the ultra rare, and the secret rare. So the three more rarity of them 
Uh, I think we did about 3 million US in the first two or three seconds in, when they open up to the public. And then the, the Uncommon sold out within an hour. And then the Common Edition, which is the largest run, uh, sold out within, I think, 23 or 24 hours. And I think that drop combined was about 4 million US in gross revenue. Um, so it was a very successful job, um, uh, considering it is just one character uh, and the Marvel Universe had thousands of characters. Totally. Yeah, no, it, it kind of, um, well, I was in that and I got a message from Johnson who, uh, who introduced us and he was like, hey, 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 hey you've got to go get the Spider-Man. It's still available. So I, I jumped in. Um, but look, I, I know as well that I'm I'm only one of what four hundred thousand users, or at least I was when we first talked. So I'm kind of curious. Yeah. Like, that yeah. I want to get to the that story, which is you launched in January, and at this stage you were at four hundred k, the start of the month, more or less, right? Uh, yeah. So around mid, uh, mid January we open up, and when we open, we had about fifty internal test users who we invited, and in. you know they were either early back. But, Bakers of our project, and since we opened up now, um, I had a look online. Uh, I think we have about over five hundred seventy thousand download active users. Could be around what you mentioned about the four hundred thousand plus mark. Um, yeah, so definitely still growing. Obviously, with more and more announcement partnership coming on board, uh, we're likely to see this, but. The first year, our projection was about 60,000 users. So we definitely uh, uh, under a bit of pressure, you know, to, to scale. And like any startup, we never thought this would going to be this many users today. So, you know, and they come with great responsibility and challenges on its own. Yeah. And uh, the, for, for, for folks who might want to go check this out afterwards, one of the things that John T suggested that I do, uh, that I really went down a very long rabbit hole with, is go and check out the YouTube community for the BB community. Because the the folks who go and collect these things, like they're, they're crazy. I mean, in a lovely way, they're just very passionate community members. Uh, and like Twitter erupts when there's a, uh, like there's a celebration thing. Again, I had no visibility over any of this. And I think, one of those uh, things that is really interesting is trying to understand, especially if anybody spends any time in the crypto world, like Ecomi is still flying under the radar. And so Dave, I, I wanna ask, you know, like obviously like talk me through that part because there's, you know, you've launched on what was called GoChain and just, you know, the, the like, what was that process like for launching? And then why have you not been sort of traditionally recognized by the, the community or the crypto community as it sort of currently stands? Yeah, so a couple of things that we, we have done. This project's been going on for since 2017, and obviously the brainstorming star earlier. Um, uh, a few, few, few major things. Um, as we know, the blockchain world moves extremely fast. Uh, you, you're almost talking every six weeks, eight weeks, or six months. It feels like it's another light year. Things are moving fast. Go chain fit what we needed to do uh, three years ago when we start this business. But we always knew that we're going to come to a blockage where scalability and either transaction speed or guest fee. At the beginning of running this business, we thought about many, many multiple levels. Um, obviously, there's a lot of moving parts when you uh, in an NFT or token business. Uh, things you need to look out for are regulatory trees. Uh, you need to look at um, the license business that we had, the technology behind that and building the actual app and, and so on. So when we chose the blockchain that we are on at that time, it fits what we wanted, low gas fees, uh, environmental friendly, which is a major issue and talked about and blockchain or NFT, you know, and also most important, it, it, that's what we needed to do. But now, uh, and I think moving forward around October, September, October, we are moving into a new blockchain, which is going to be a layer to Ethereum, which is a public knowledge now. Uh, mm -hmm. We're working with a counterpart in Australia, um, great team. They've been in the, in the NFT gaming business for the past four years and become one of the most successful NFT game exists. 
Um, so we're moving to that. And once again, because it gives us multiple layers of complexity for our business uh, and as well as scalar and scalability. As you understand that Ethereum, you know, being on the F blockchain is, is quite crucial, um, yep. you know, for mass adoption. Yeah, I think the the, the part that, um, and, it, and if I may provide some reflection, I think the reason that we haven't seen you turn up has been because GoChain is a sort of relatively obscure uh, sidechain for, for Ethereum that it doesn't have ERC712 ERC compliance. So right. it's one of these things of when when you ship, I can see what's going to happen if you shift across to Immutable and all of a sudden you're sort of like sitting on the equivalent of a, you know, from a compatible chain. And, I think at that point, like the, the penny will drop for a lot of people that like, holy crap, wait a second, there's some group in here who one, have the NFTs locked up for all of these incredible brands and they've got, and, then, and they're already on Ethereum. In actual fact, they've already got a community that's a juggernaut. Um, and it just, yeah, those things will click on. I don't think they have quite yet. And so that, you know, it's part of the reason I find it's such an exciting story. And obviously right now also such an exciting story. Um, yeah, so, so look, I mean, I, I want to talk a little bit about that company journey for you because it was, you know, like, I, I, you know, when you and I were talking and you said, you know, we would go into these meetings and try and explain what an NFT was. I can, I mean, I've, you know, I've been around crypto for a while as well. So people kind of, you know, it is that story. Nobody knew what the hell these things were. Um, how did you, how did you, how was it to, to kind of um, go from, hey, we've got an idea to we're trying to raise money and then, you know, that obviously as well i know that you had a, a kind of a nudge to launch in january so um just talk us that part, that the, part. so if the first i will say the first three three years we were almost traveling one city or one country every 10 day or every two weeks pretty much as you know if you want to be in the business and you need to learn fast you need to be in front of people's face so we went through a journey pretty much we'll turn up every blockchain or crypto meetup event where we'll be in Singapore, Tokyo, Hong Kong, New York, uh, Korea. It will be pretty much flying everywhere. And that community just got bigger and bigger and bigger. I mean, well, I remember going to consensus, uh, you know, I think the second year they had a host of the third year and the event was just huge, humongous. And you know, the eruption of the rooms, everyone's all positive. Now, part of that was all really in the ICO hype. You know, a lot of people went, went through that and joined in. We, we were kind of the, really the underdog because we believe in the NFT is going to be a huge thing where everyone in the blockchain is all talking about protocols, you know, raising money to build this um you know, product the whole world will use. We really believe that, well, you have a great protocol, you have a great blockchain, you need to have applications. Um, so we set ourselves to be one of the best application. Um, and I do have to admit, it was extremely, extremely hard to raise money. I mean, we had one friends and family round, uh, pretty much that's all we managed to raise. And then we will, we had to do an IEO in Singapore with our Singapore company. And that really just, and it was a very small race. And just, just so you know the context, this company raising billions or hundreds of million, I think we down little less than 3 million in our IEO. Uh, and during that period, you know, whatever we raise, the market was going winter time, you know, the crypto winter really came. So whatever we raised, you pretty much took a huge discount on it, on what the real life uh, money you got on hand during this crowd sale. Um, we, uh, uh, you know, we, we lived through, we had pretty much were on the shoestring budget. Myself and Dan, uh, we took no salary, no wages, you know, every now and then we have a very small join just to pay cover some costs uh, we pretty much had to move up to asia because uh it was cheap to live there um you know it's probably like one fifth what we pay here you you could you know there was days that will be on dollar 50 us meal a day because the convenience store was just cheap you you pretty much have to live through that grant uh, we did that um we built a team and we found all the teams 
uh, pretty much remote, which we can touch a little bit later on how we run. Uh, yeah, so raising funds was extremely difficult. Um, I think around December, January uh, last year, uh, this, January this year, December last year, we were pretty much down to the last couple of weeks money left. Uh, it will be pretty much week on week. And the, the great thing is uh, Visa American Express came very, very handy. And, <laughs> you know, I, I mentioned a lot of time, if, if, if anyone was converting their uh, debt into equity, they would be my largest shareholder. Uh, we were on the string of closing. Myself and Dan, I think we, we did talk about three or four times in the, in the morning. Um, yeah, and, it, and he was in my bubble, so we were living together. Um, and we'll say, do we pull the string today? And, um, you know, many of our advisors told us, hey, you really should go to the market and just see what the people, if the app have any opportunity to live. Um, we decided to go live. Um, and what, what you know today is basically, uh, I think I remember the first couple hundred bucks of sale came through and I told Dan, you know, I think we could pay for the web, uh, you know, Shopify or the web thing that is running the subscription on. And then we have a couple thousand and I say, oh, we can pay half the month wages for that developer. And pretty much the whole business will be like that. Um, obviously, part of this whole scaling is all about the server. And we had uh, AWS is one of our main key partner. Um, and I tell you, I, I remember reading every single person out, uh, you know, uh, and tried to get some Amazon credit. And it's incredibly hard. Amazon basically said, well, you need to be invested by some VC or someone put something in. And luckily, one of our advisor uh, that you guys will know of um, made some connection. Um, uh, we were over thrilled. Uh, the credit came uh, next morning into our account. I got an email from the New Zealand head go, you're very lucky. I don't know who you spoke to, but we've been told to give you this credit. And basically that bought us another week uh, of, you know, keeping this business going. And around January, as you know, we went public live and that number really just escalate, escalate um, into what, what you see today. Um, and it, it's, a pay, it's a huge pressure point. Um, you you grow in a business from no money where you can't hire people to update. There, there was many, many times that we talked about, do we freeze uh, new signups or do we just let it go? So a yeah. lot of key moment in decision-making we had to do. And with the, cause I mean, the, the, the thing that like kind of struck me about that story <clears throat> was it was almost, you know, like you were so close to being dead. And then at the same time, as soon as you launch, it, it feels to me like, not an overnight success because it was just three years of backstory and all that sort of stuff to it to get to that point. But as soon as you, there was such a clear demand from a customer, like a, an incredible product market fit there, uh, as soon as you launched and, and um, yeah, like it, it's just a kind of a beautiful, I mean, I'm really happy obviously that you've made it through and that you've been able to do it. Um, but the one part, you know, there, there's a specific thing in there, which is like you say, it was really hard to raise. And the folks that you talk to, like I assume there was just a real, um, I, I, I know at the moment in the New Zealand uh, like uh, early stage investment community, it's really challenging to raise for crypto, like um, even now still. It, it was almost impossible. We, we would, um, so we, we came back around March 2020 and we had to take the last flight from San Francisco to, to, to New Zealand. Um, we actually had a couple of VC meeting, one with SoftBank and a few other uh, major uh, venture capitalists. And I, we, we arrived on a Friday evening in San Francisco and the COVID basically followed us faster than ever. On Saturday morning, we got a letter from, you know, these VC starting to cancel. So we had about an eight day um, plan, how we're going to pitch it, how we're going to present it, show them, because we actually had a proof of concept by then. Um, unfortunately, we had to take the last flight from me in New Zealand back to New Zealand. We arrived in pretty much within, I think, 48 or 72 hours after landing, New Zealand went into lockdown. I think the first four months, 
during this COVID crisis, it was extremely tough because there was no feces to take in call. I think the precaution for them is they, they really want to see how this whole thing um, plan out. So on top of really very tough, apart from the pandemic coming, you um, we, we almost had everything. Uh, we were, you know, facing the wind the whole way. Uh, uh, this The success of what we had was purely in our mental um, strength uh, to carry out through. Um, we, we were running at low in cash and, and we had to downsize dramatically during the uh, time. And therefore also that held us back on when we can launch the product just so we have uh, enough bin rate. And you, you are right, in, any uh, crypto or any startup, you know, ne ne never mind what industry you're in, it is very, very tough to raise money, especially when you're in New Zealand, uh, business. A lot of the VC like to see your base up there, you in the valley, um, amongst all the other tech startups. They feel more comfortable. Um, a lot of the VC we spoke to, you know, will hesitate about investing down here uh, because they don't understand what the tax requirement for them is, etc. Back and forward. Um, so it, it was very, very challenging. So. The other, the other part of that fundraising story, and, and I'm, I'm conscious of the crowd and wanting to also move on, so we'll keep that one, this one tight. But um, so you did the, you did a uh, an IEO, an ex mm -hmm. initial exchange offering on the uh, Bitforex, which is based in Singapore, as a way to raise capital. So did you do that? Uh, you did that back in which year? Yeah, that was around uh, two two thousand nineteen. Uh, right. Okay. Two nineteen. And with that, um, the the like. You know, it, it, did you see that as an alternative? Like, I, what what I'm trying to think about is, if there are crypto companies in New Zealand, do you think that that's a viable route for them to be going and raising capital, or does it end up just with way more complexity than you know for for the sort of business that you? Yeah. You know, so, yeah. one one of the major part is about navigating through jurisdictions and legislations. Um, at that moment, that time when we were planning in late 218 to do uh, IEO or raise crowdfunding, um, the New Zealand uh, crypto or digital law and these assets were not very clear. Um, there was few jurisdictions, a, a little bit better. There's few countries up in Asia and most other one was, um, I think, East European countries. What we wanted to do is to ensure that we set up a proper entity offshore um, that's you know different than what we do in New Zealand to run that um, for, for the purpose is that we don't want to have any issues with uh, legislations not being clear and regulatory issue. Um, it, it was a very uh, clear decision for us that Singapore was going to be the the most welcome and friendly country in, in crypto. And I believe a lot of digital asset exchange or crypto uh, business are coming out from there. And we're seeing a huge rough and it continues. Uh, they're very welcoming. Uh, if you have great technology, great project, um, it, it works well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so what the, re the relationship, if you can just be really clear with me, so between uh, the OMI token, which is what was raised in the IEO that was uh, raised on Bitforex, and the New Zealand company, which is, I understand it, is the one that actually has the licenses and, and mm. effectively like issues the and generates the capital. Yeah. Or so, the, so the New Zealand company actually owns the platform that this um, all these NFT sits on. And the Singapore company um, had these crowdfunding, we raised funds. And with the funds that we raised, we managed to secure what we call the, the first layer of the license source. And these license sources, you know, we're minting these NFTs to be on this platform, which is run in New Zealand. So really, um, there's a license agreement between the two entities uh, to ensure that it's very transparent and they're segregated separately. New Zealand is more of a, company that will be is running the show running empowering these uh, technology the Singapore company is really about the minting of these collectibles um, to be sold on on the platform so they segregated one is very 
platform. We have a B2B product, we have a B2C product, um, where the Singapore one is very much into minting of the NFT uh, and behind it, the engine. Yeah. Excellent. Um, yeah, I, I know that there are folks who, you know, and, I, and as someone who is an investor and has been looking at this, I have when I tried to dig in and try and understand that relationship and also where the OMI token is and what the value mm-hmm. of it is and, where, and how that works. Um, and that's still, if I'm, if I'm totally honest, it still sl- feels to me slightly opaque, but one of those things that I'm sure will get cleared up over time as well. Great. Um, yeah, because it's uh, the, the only token is the one that's currently traded on GoChain and, and is really uh, white. Uh, so Ecomi tied to the, the and that sort of thing. So yeah. Um, mm. uh, awesome. Hey, look, well, I'm, I'm kind of, con- yeah, I'm conscious of time. And uh, just for, also for folks who are on the call, I'm keen to do probably another 20, 25 minutes or so of, of talking to David and then I'd love to go to questions for, for you. So um, if you've got anything, feel free to drop them into chat and then uh, I think we can get to that in a little bit. Um, David, so one of the things, obviously, you said, you know, you ended up going largely remote for your for your for your team, to your workforce, to be able to build for this. Um, can you talk me through that? Like, how hard has it been to get talent? Obviously, like, there's been a challenge with getting people into New Zealand specifically. Was it? Did you have to do that because of that? Um, or yeah, I, I mean, couple couple reasons. Um, num- number one, we we saw out to be the best at what we do, and you know, for the best, you really need to look for global talent. Um, uh, it actually worked very well with us. Everyone is actually remote, uh, and you know, one way or another, we do we do have small offices up in Asia uh, where you know we're no longer actively using due to COVID. Uh, now we're grown from about six seven employees now to around thirty. Um, what we have found worked for us is to ensure that we have. Number one is every time zone covered. Uh, if we need help, support, um, that's number one. And number two is we really go, you know, especially our engineering team. The lead in our engineering team goes, you know, go through a very high caliber of testing on engineers. We go through a number of cuts and then Generally, all these talents are based either US, Europe, we have India, Southeast Asia. Uh, the some of the issue around talents in New Zealand is that we it's in the same industry already. Blockchain is very new, so to get coders, to get engineers in Pacific industry and the language that we write in, etc., for the app. Uh, blockchain is only really small part of our business. We got inside the app, as you have seen, you know, you got the store, you got the marketplace, we have the social fee, which is a quite key part why we become successful. So, yeah, we, we just want to make sure that um, the talents are accessible globally. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And so with that, I mean, so you contract them from the New Zealand company. Is it, has it, has it been problematic? Or like, is there anything that I'm, I, I want to ask the question because I know we've got some New Zealand government folks on the call, Google Callahan, that sort of thing. Like, what are the opportunities that we would have uh, specifically around talent if we're thinking about the crypto space? Like, is there a it, how how can we better support uh, in that space? And is it? I I think the, number one is well anything to do with crypto. Number uh, uh, New Zealand's a great uh, easy entry to do business here. And many people know, I think we rank on one of the top in the world where transparency, no corruption, is out, it's extremely easy to set up a company here. Um, you know, I think as a country, we very welcoming entrepreneurs to be here. Uh, but in specifically in crypto or on blockchain, the problem where it comes to is that you have roadblocks, uh, banking issues, you know, the minute you tell your bank you work on blockchain, um, they they close your account. It's free, so they don't even understand, or they they don't want to understand. Um, I know a number of them. Uh, we, as a company, uh, my banking relationship with bank, even the bank I bank with for twenty five years, didn't even want to talk to me um, about it. So we were rejected. So that's number one. Is that um, you? You can be a very friendly country to easily set these things up but if other things doesn't really come along it, it does turn people off and 
you know, legislation, I, I guess we really need to understand that this is going to be a new class of asset. Uh, if, if it's not an asset, then you say it's not. If it is, how do we legislate it? Um, more clarity. And, you know, once you have clarity, more and more, you know, entrepreneurs or programmers will start jumping in because they see opportunity. I mean, through, through in every industry we're in, it's all about opportunity. People see clear opportunity. They don't want to be, you know, labeled as criminals or scams or any of these. Uh, it's really to understand how we can, you know, adopt this. Um, and and is it, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I note um, that there's <clears throat> in New Zealand, uh, that, so the parliament at the moment is doing an investigate, well, investigation, what investigation is doing a review of uh, crypto space. And if anybody here uh, has an understanding of that, the terms of reference on this are pretty terrible. It's all about how it's being used to enable money laundering and all that sort of stuff with no, with no kind of lookout into what the opportunities might be for the space and things. So, this is just a frustration that I generally have. But um, yeah, if there, if there were sort of specific things that they could do, uh, government could be do doing either about fundraising, hiring or talent, where could they be, where could they be assisting and helping uh, more in this space? Yeah, I think education is going to be a quite key sector um, and, and really welcoming people to come down under, you know, you know, put on things like what you we, we're doing here today. People understand what the frustrations, uh, clarity, you know, we we had quite a bit of problem about our, how we can spend our R&D money. Um, obviously, we were not a huge employer in New Zealand based because most of our employees or contractors are offshore. So therefore, you know, for us to claim our credits is almost impossible to navigate because we don't meet any of those. Uh, limitations, uh, infrastructure, I think we have very, very good. Um, you know, I speak to a lot of other uh, people in the industry and they, you know, with, as, as we know, up in the Asia, um, especially in China, the crypto mining's now being moved out and a lot of them are going to Texas, uh, other part of the world. You know, I have spoke to people who believe that the geothermal plant we have in New Zealand with these excess power could be doing things. You know, there's a lot of great ideas, things coming out, but, you know, once again, without clarity and government support on these, uh, we are missing out. I mean, what we really need to understand that the creative content uh, is going to be here to stay because people are buying more and more of these digital uh, contents, um, whether that's NFT or other ways. And when you have a rise in these creative content being purchased, ownership of digital content will rise and people will want to store these digitally in wallets or in different forms of uh, platforms. So we really have a huge opportunity here moving on uh, to, you know, to welcome these. And there's gaming companies I spoke to this week um, thinking, you know, how they can integrate NFT into games. And we seen an article out here in New Zealand, uh, especially reportedly last week that, you know, the gaming sector is fun, you know, finally is getting some attention and yeah. Uh, it could be one of our biggest exporter. I mean, we would like to think, um, you know, all these will help to contribute a lot more to speed things up. Excellent. Um, there's a, uh, just as a specific one, Binu, uh, who's at FMA, uh, just noted, uh, thanks for, please connect on the debanking issue. He's trying to sort it as well. So uh, yeah, it's been a widespread issue. We'll, we'll connect you after the call. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, and now I, I, I want to, um, I know that there's, you know, a number of people in here who are saying, one, how do I invest? But we'll come back to that. Um, the, what's your vision for, for Vida from here on out? And, and like, you know, I, I, one of the things that really struck me when we were doing this kind of prep call around this is you were like, yeah, the NFTs are kind of interesting, but they're like a byproduct of where we're, like what we're trying to build. You know? Yeah, um, I, I, I'd be very honest. I mean, when we start to raise the money, our white paper of our business plan was so huge. <clears throat> um, and that could be possibly one of the reasons why we couldn't raise money because we were not very focused in one specific area. 
Uh, we chose the digital collectible at the end to go as our MVP product simply because we knew uh, we can get the brains. We knew we, we are a force behind the security. So we do have another product that's a hardware product that allows digital assets to sit on. And it's really a secure uh, cold storage wallet. Really, um, as you know, in 2016, 17, all you read on the papers every other day is that some exchange got hacked, someone's hacked your computer, taken this digital asset. So we thought, for us to have this brand on board, you, you really need to demonstrate that you have security. So um, we build um, security put up for these assets to sit on, for these brands to really be, believe and behind us uh, to bring our product out. Now, that's number one. And I mentioned to you is really a byproduct because it's hot right now. I mean, and unfortunately that's how we generate the revenue. But what most people don't really understand is the, the driving force behind this is really about fandom. We just wanted to build a collectible product platform where people can buy these 3D models. Uh, a major part on our platform is the user generated content. Like you have shown on your phone that Spider-Man can appear an augmented reality, you can take a photo, you can upload it. So if you think about um, throughout the year 2005, you have the, I think Facebook came out, Instagram came out, oh, YouTube came out back then. And then you have Instagram, you have Twitter, you have LinkedIn. Um, and now we have TikTok that's very, very popular. Every single one of these social media platform represent something and whether there's a generation or a very specific target audience and how they reach out. Now, we wanted to build a fandom uh, application where fans can come to one place and, and I run a physical shop and in back of my retail shop, I have tables. You will see 40 to 50% of my retail store have trestle tables and chair for people to play on. So at any weather, at any time, apart from COVID time, you can come to my store and you can meet one and another, speak the same language, and you become best friends. We go to, what, what our business is about is understanding the second secret of you, understanding what you dress up. So Oliver, I believe that you dress up as Pikachu when you go to these comic cons. Hey, how did you and <laughs> <laughs> and then on the Monday morning, uh, uh, on Tuesday, here we are talking and like normal people. But yep. once you know someone's second secret of what they do, what they love, whether if it's a game, you, you get along very well. Vivi is about bringing these fandoms to one place. They can share and create that community. That community aspect is a very big part. So... Um, and no one's tapping into that. That's a multi-billion dollar business where the fans are coming into one place. So every single week, like you say, on YouTube and social media, there's this hype to celebration drops. Um, and we've seen this business down physical. We have seen Adidas, for example, or Nike, when they release the shoes, you go to in front of your favorite sneaker store, you take a ticket, and basically that ticket gives you a chance to participate on their drop day. And on the drop day, you line up, you stand outside and everyone claps. When they read out your number, everybody clap because, and they celebrate for you to win a chance to buy a pair. And by that time you haven't even bought it and everyone was so hyped up uh, around this because they're building that community. What we want to do is similar with fandom. And we believe these brands that we have uh, and it's bringing us combined the hundreds of years of content that we can be shaping that content in a different way. Similar to uh, now we have uh, streaming through Netflix, streaming through um, Hulu, Disney Plus, all these things. Now, I really believe that these characters is now about to come to life. So going back to where you, uh, your question was, where we're going to be coming up, gamification. We really believe that the gaming industry, these assets that you are playing as a character, some skins, on weapon upgrades, could one day to be taken out from one game and to be sold. 
and to be augmented out into the real world. That's number one. We really strongly believe that the wearable device, uh, the AR glasses or the VR glasses, and we're pretty sure Apple, Google, all these genius companies are going to be coming out with these light wearables. Apart from what you want to see about from your email, your text message, you really want to see Batman or Spider-Man standing in the corner of your room. And those are digital. And then digital artwork, you put on the glasses, uh, you know, your more name maybe is playing on the wall. That's another huge. And the metaverse, um, uh, we have announced that uh, the Fiviverse is coming. And there's something that we are very proud and being actively working on is to bring this metaverse. Well, we, we knew the metaverse would be a way of communities all come to one place to build together. Um, and, and, you know, this, this is nothing really new. I mean, what we have created, uh, I don't want anyone to go away to think, you know, we have invented something. We haven't. AR was already there. These IPs are already there. Apps are already there. What me and Dan have put together is just really what the fans want, and we basically put it all on one app. So you can think of it, the VV apps is about four or five different applications into one uh, providing that end-to-end -end, you know experience um you know and i can go on forever you know <laughs> yeah no, no no this is this is super uh, good but it, i think that the, the part that really struck me about this was just um uh like the idea of having um you know being able to turn up in some virtual universe and be able to be like this is my spider-man or whatever uh you know in a, in a in a very you know um one of the things I found about NFTs and generally like is that it's that it's really like belonging to a club, you know, and it's about being able to say I'm in that club. And mm -hmm. that is such a powerful kind of human need. It's just at this, you know, the job to be done is to want to belong. And you've worked out how to do that at a digital scale with incredible margins and ability to be able to be geographically wherever you want to be. And mm -hmm. I think there's a really beautiful um, part of that, which is still really not fully understood. Anyway, um, hey, look, I just want to, uh, two, two questions and then I'm keen to go to, uh, uh, two more questions for me and then we'll go to go to questions. But, um, you know, obviously, look, we've got the EHF community on here. We've got a bunch of other investors and, and folks who are kind of in New Zealand who are on here. Um, what can they do on this call to help you build your company? Yeah, so we, um, we num number one, um, our business is run across pretty much every globally this is an app that's running 24 7 we don't switch it off uh, we need more talent i mean if, if you know what we're reaching out to see if you think um you can help in talent number one is that number you know and developments or running the business um you know we we have an issue with scaling um you know i have run multiple business in a different field um, and I really always believe that uh, the scaling business, in my mind, is always have the 1, 7, 17, 70, 300 rule. So um, you start off as a one uh, co-founder with co-founder. So in this case, me and Dan, one. Then we employed our first seven people. We go to the first 17, 70, 300. You know, we're in the process of now about to scale from this 17 to 70 uh, brackets so you know there's a lot of you know governance that we need help on structure um, you know we work tirelessly to read things on forums how people run scale business you know number one is we need help from all parts of the world that's one um, and no, number two like any business eventually we do we do need to raise more money and that's probably one of the part of uh, my biggest failure in this project is that I failed to raise the money that is required. We, we spend 30, 40 hours a week uh, out of the 100 plus hours we put in just to look at fundraising. And at that end, you're still not able to raise. So I need to reflect. I need helps uh, on understanding, you know, what, what makes fundraising work, how the structure is. Um, you know, there's a lot of aspect uh, when you look at it. When I have a down moment, I look at things that we didn't do well on. And, you know, fundraising is definitely one of them. 
But with any founder and any, you know, enterprise or entrepreneur, they, they are just thinking very much going straight as fast as possible. Um, and then or obviously, you, you, you know, your paperwork, everything's just get bogged up. So, you know, we, we need help in, in many different ways to navigate through to be a billion dollar or oh, a unicorn company where we want it to be. Yeah, excellent. Um, hey, well, uh, the, you kind of answered my other question, which was around investing and, and, and obviously you're looking to raise funds. Um, do, do you want to just uh, elaborate on that specifically? Because I, I am conscious we've got a bunch of investors on the call. Yeah, um, I mean, right this moment, um, we're still going through a growth phase. I mean, my, my concentration right now has been working on you know, all our efforts has been on scaling, really, in our our staff technology. And I think, you know, on maybe the fourth quarter or uh, this year, we'll start look at doing one round. And that's really expanding into areas that we are weak on. Um, you know, our, our biggest market right now is US, followed by, I think we have uh, Canada, uh, UK, France, Germany, Australia, you know, the, the key two key market that we really need to em embrace and get into is Japan, huge fandom. I mean, that market alone is crazy. You've seen the intellectual property that come out from there. Uh, Greater China area is another area where we see a huge, tremendous growth. Those key areas needs to have dedicated teams. They need to have localization language, et cetera. We really believe that. Uh, part of the funds will be raised, will be spent on that. Um, and obviously I mentioned about the metaverse, which we already start to iron out how we want to do. Um, you know, going forward is either we grow organically, which will be a bit slower, or do we actively spend and invest in these territory to grow that team? So we, 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 we are hoping that on the fourth quarter this year that we, we can start work on that. Excellent. Great. Well, um, yeah, folks, if you've got any uh, specific questions, feel free to jump in. Um, you can either ask them in the chat or you can put your hand up and I'll, and I'll work out how to um, unmute you and we can, we can go there. Um, there is a sort of very specific question that's come through, um, which is from Carlos, and he, he asked specifically around um, uh, what's the team, how does the team look? And what, um, like, you know, you said you sort of you and, and, and yeah. you founded Dan. So um, uh, the, the team, there's myself and Daniel, we're the co-founder of the company. Uh, we do have CTO. Uh, we do have, head, you know, the executive teams really in production, design, licensing, et cetera. Then we have our engineers. Um, most of our employees are really engineer and dev, uh, devops. Um, and the, you know, we're just only starting to start to look at building out the management team. And uh, most of our work going out, like, like you have seen today, it's really being our community, being supporting us in the marketing, getting things out. Um, you know, this is a very hard, we, we, we're in a very, very tough position. We do have marketing funds and we do have ways we want to market. But the problem is right now we're getting all these downloads and the user come into the app and they go, well, there's nothing for to purchase, you know, because our drop sells out in a microsecond or in, within a minute every single week. So you can imagine if you're a Marvel fan, you download the app, you go, okay, cool. Tomorrow at 8 a.m. they're going to be releasing something. You come at A or 2, it's already sold out. So the community, and so we, we are, we, we're in the middle of going, well, you know, if you're a new user, you download it, you just come in, you go, well, this is stupid. There's nothing to purchase. So we, we are thinking to start to roll out more and more content. Um, and all, obviously we have a backlog of content. So the teams increase in right now to scale that content production line. So we have more and more IP uh, onboarding. Yeah, great. Awesome. Thanks, David. Um, An awesome talk, amazing story. Just to follow on from that, when in terms of the engineers that you've you've hired, mm -hmm. did, what was your approach? Because obviously you're working in quite 
specific technology with you know the go blockchain and and the smart contract space and nfts did you focus on finding people who already could could do this work like re resourcing from consensus or did you focus on tr on finding good software developers and training them in cryptography and blockchain nft smart contracts yeah that, that's a great question um yeah we we do go out to look for talents who already know these um known issues and things but of course i mentioned earlier on the call that this industry is so nascent it just goes so fast every six weeks there's something happening so what we have done is right now the app itself is a closed ecosystem um so um oliver mentioned the the nft is actually sitting inside the app we don't allow the users right now to send it out for the purposes that when we move to for example immutable which is a great team supporting us that the 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 interconnectivity is just going to try to you know connect from one chain to another then that the interruptible um can start happening when the license speak to us to go yes we are comfortable with this their layer of security i mean the the development it's not really just uh, on the blockchain the blockchain is just really a part of our business to authenticate verifications the minting of the NFT, but the, the actual app itself has multiple layers. I mean, we, we have a Unity engine inside for you to walk through that uh, virtual showroom and you can share that showroom for your friend anywhere in the world to come into your room to see how you put your collectibles together. So there's actually multiple levels of, of these uh, that works together than just one uh than just really blockchain there's a um there's a question here from uh oh sorry carlos is, there, is that cool no i was just being polite saying thanks for the answer oh okay <laughs> yeah, cool. um uh nicholas asks how could other industries use nfts to create a positive impact on the uh, on the environment or society in other words how could social enterprise use this technology in your view yeah um so uh, there, there's quite a bit out there. I mean, a lot of the industries become more innovative. innovative. Um, number one is um, not all blockchains are bad. I mean, environmental, you know, friend, there's a lot out there is environmental friendly, like the one that we're moving to or even the one that we are on. Um, you know, the perception, I think, out there, number one, people think, you know, anything that uses energy consumption is bad. Um, you know, with the, with all the mining, etc. Uh, but the social impact out there, we have seen, you know, organization, including us, we, we have actually put together a fund um, to help social environmental impact. Um, and we, we just really have only just started to look for a head in that our, our social charities section um, and how we're going to be funding um out, out of part of what we gross earn to put back to the community that's number one um so internally we're doing it we really believe that uh the beauty about the blockchain is transparency so if you can see organizations getting funded for x amount of money you see how that money is being spent and you know how the treasury works so you know multiple levels where the technology can be useful. Number one is that transparency. Um, and obviously it still needs a lot of adoptions, you know, for other organizations or companies to take those digital assets or transfer and adopt them. Uh, fundraising, there's a lot of ways um, charities can fundraise through uh, minting their own NFT to get support from the communities in, in different ways. It, it's just another mechanism out there or another medium of tools that's available that we should really embrace and utilize on. Um, and definitely, you know, it, it, if you don't think you need to use blockchain, don't use it. I mean, there's a lot of things out there. It's quite pointless. I see it from day to day or time to time that there's no need for it. So 
please, you know, um, you, you, you do want to choose carefully whether you need it or not, uh, or you just want to do one. Yeah. No, yeah, totally. I'm, I'm not against at all. I think it's a really, really powerful tool that can be used for very good things as well. That's why I was asking and been following for a while. And yeah, I think there's like with creativity and innovation, like a lot of amazing things could be done with these technologies. Thank you. Uh, anybody else who's got a specific question? Otherwise, I have uh, a few more that uh, have been sent through privately. Yeah, Oliver. Yeah, yeah. Sure. Yeah, sorry. Um, I was just wondering, David, um, thanks for the talk, by the way. It's fantastic. Um, just if you could speak a little to the demographics that you, you're witnessing in the um, NFT, NFT space. So presumably, it's, it's reasonably overweight, younger individuals. Uh Actually, you could be wrong. Um, uh, All right. the, the, the major age is about 22 to 48. It's very strong in the 25 plus. Um, I, I tell you, when you say young, I mean, we know guys, um, you know, pe people in much earlier stage now it's into the crypto. Um, and I, 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 you know, I, I think because the product that we bring out demographically it's been very catered to i mean the the some of the early nft that we have brought out like the delorean time machine you know that there's certain age group right people get it so um and, but now we are seeing more and more i mean comic books us out um you know we release our first edition marvel number one 1939 comic book um i think last wednesday or thursday and that was a major hit. Uh, we we had sixty thousand copies basically sold out, and a lot of our newer fans, obviously, you know, they weren't born in nineteen forties and buying one of these original comic. They they young readers, they readers that just came out that you know they never seen what the comic looked like in the nineteen thirties. Now they have a chance to own one. We have embedded and build in, roll out a technology in our phone now, you can read that NFT. So you can read the digital comics as well. Um, and I think this week, I believe that we are adopting the AR function. So you can read the comic on your table, scale it up, flip the pages, and actually be part and live into the comic itself. So that's something quite exciting we're doing. And uh, to that Christian Patrick is that we want to start to hope we, we get a bit younger audience into it. Uh, but right now, 25, 48 is a very, uh, it's a major group. Great, thank you. Um, there's a question here uh, for, for, uh, for uh, it's come in. Are you worried about the current hype around NFTs will pull back much like VR five years ago? Or is the space here to stay? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, de definitely, uh, I, and I think many people use right now the reference um, to where the internet was, but I think the slight different thing about where we were in the you know, 90s when the internet all come out, this community of the NFT has actually produced a lot of opportunities. Um, you have seen a lot of these artists that are coming out expressing through digital medium um, and creating things. And, you, you know, the, the beauty about the non-fungible side is, you know, the artworks on my wall, you might come in, you might go, well, that's not for my taste. But the audience today out there, they see things very different and they, they almost buy it to encourage one another. It's like a peer support and building that community. And that community is very, very solid. I do have to have to say where the internet back then is all about infrastructure. You know, we, we're living in a world where internets are fast, phones is very mobile to us, everything is all around us. You know, we can switch the lights on, the, you know, the wall switch and the light comes on. So things are very much different to where we were. So I really think... Um, when when people say there's a hype, I mean it, it's definitely a hype going to be here to stay. We will what we will start to see is better and better products start to come out where the media okay or you know really overhyped type of project will start to fizzle away. But you know I read 
online, I, I think even June quarter, the the sale of NFT have still continued. I mean, some of these uh, exchanges or, or auction sites or secondary market like OpenSea and all that, they are mm. showing very aggressive growth. Yeah. A, a, a bit, I, I was mind blown that how aggressive it is. Um, so we can see the community is just getting bigger. And I think I mentioned earlier, you know, we are living in the content, digital content world, and there were just more and more people. And the young adopters really understand because this industry hasn't really just started because of blockchain or COVID. The gaming market alone is a 60 billion plus a year on buying skins buying, you know, character weapons or skins for their guns or their parents. It's already a huge business. Just now that business is starting to transform into another shape of ownerships. Yeah, I, I, I'll add something in there as well, if, if, you don't, if you don't mind, David, which is I, you know, it took me a little while to get NFTs. And the one that really kind of clicked my, my understanding around the market and how this might work was when Gary Vanderchuk uh, launched his uh, restaurant. So he's launching a restaurant in which the ownership of the tape. So to fund the startup of the restaurant, they are selling the tables. And if you own a table, you get a portion of the revenue. And then anybody who wants to come in and book that table can effectively rent the table inside of the restaurant. And you have to pay for to get that table for a particular hour of the day. Mm -hmm. And then that's transferable. So you can go in and book it and effectively you might pay $5 or something like that to get the access to the table. But then if you then go on and on sell it and say, for example, you, you manage to get something on a Friday night, really high cost or whatever to this very fancy restaurant, you can then uh, decide to sell it on. The underlying revenue of the, the transfer of the asset ends up going back to the person who owns the table. And so as a result, there's like a really strong community. And if you own a table inside of that restaurant, then it's sort of like access to a club and you mm -hmm. can go, I choose not to sell it to anybody or I choose to whatever. And I, I just... It's, it was the first time I was like, oh, you know, that's, uh, you know, there's some complexity in there to work out and we have to build the infrastructure to be able to handle all of that properly. But like where you go to where it starts interfacing with the real world and like the size of the new business models that it will enable. Like I can think about you as well, though, like at the moment with the transfer of the asset. So say, for example, someone buys something on the secondary, is there a, there is a fee that they pay to the platform for being able yeah. to trade those? So, so right now, um, just like uh, any eBay or TradeMe we hit down here, um, there's a seller's premium. Uh, we click a very small percentage, like a 2.5%, really just to keep our system going and pay some bills. Um, so, um, you know, this is nothing new. I mean, Auction House has been using it for a number of years on the seller's premium or buyer's premium, what, what have you not. We really do see that, you know, what obviously what you just talked about with Gary's uh, different way of NFT, there's actually a lot of different other ways to monetize through NFT. And I think last time we had a phone call, I touched base that uh, an NFT could be an identity. It could be, you know, that character or that mark, your NFT, that mark, but it's my identity. I could use it as a payment. So we, we certainly as a company are always in the forefront to, to see what are the adoptions and how you can transfer that character that you own. Apart from just that image, you're using the codes behind it to be a payment mechanism or it could be a technology for some other thing to your password or something. So there, you know, there's a lot of layers that you know, many, many other you know, engineers out there are looking to adopt in a different way. And, and therefore, this is one of the reasons I think the hype, it's not really a hype in a way because if you hit, start to have utility value out of it, people can do things. I mean, that Spider-Man you bought, you know, half of the fun is really just having it around you and you can mm. pop this stand behind it and yeah. share with your friend. So the value of utility will come um, further down the track, I, I believe, and that will drive the massive adoption in NFT. Yeah, I didn't have a, I couldn't find it, but I wanted to share, there was an amazing video that someone put up on Twitter of what the AR verse will start to look like when you can skin everything. And mm -hmm. so it was people walking around with like, 
um, jackets that are you, you just you know someone and it's um, but they're wearing this sort of very futuristic thing and then they look down at their shoes and their shoes are kind of like made to look very custom and that you know it's not you it's it's all just um, digital that you can see through the AR burst but I can see something like that where you have persistent AR through glasses and then people kind of walking around and wanting to be able to social signal to each mm. other it's like hey I'm you know, in this world, in this world in which we're all in AI glasses, I'm cool, I'm important, I'm, I'm, I'm significant. Yeah. And being able to walk around with the Spider-Man on your shoulder is, a, is, you know, it would look weird, but it would be cool, you know? I, I, I would want, maybe that's what I'll use it for when I can eventually uh, yeah. integrate it into this world. <laughs> I, w- I was back there when BB was cool, you know, like right back in the very beginning and got this, you know, collectible and you can see it. And that, and so anyhow, um. Uh, yeah, there was um, the, 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 the one, there's also a question here and, and one that I'm really curious about. So you, you obviously mentioned the Navigate, like uh, migrating from Go, Go Chain into Immutable X. So Immutable X, as you, as you mentioned, um, based in Sydney, team are a lot, for, probably a lot further along in terms of the capabilities of the chain and things like that. Can you just talk me through like how, how that's even going to work? Like how do you, can you, can you just simply like um, swap out all of the OMI tokens in one chain into another and that's easy yeah, so um, so we 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 nearly there uh, in the integration bit, and eventually uh, the NFT we will be reminting them basically. Um, um, so that's why part of the app right now doesn't show you the the address of these because what we don't want is confuse our user to go well the address will search the hours change that so we do that centralized um to get that cross over uh, we will be setting up sites for people to basically swap their tokens over um and this will be very well uh, advertised throughout you know our websites in the coming months um and obviously we'll get there there's going to be a huge period for you to do it it's not going to be like you have to do it within two hours type of thing or you lose it. Mm. Um, yeah, so a lot of communication will be giving out. Uh, this is nothing new. A lot of uh, change, uh, a lot of projects do change chains. Um, so um, this is quite a regular thing. Um, unfortunately for, for us, uh, we have a lot of users, so it, it does take a bit longer. And David, just to build on that question, is will there be any change to the the tokenomics of the OMI token and or the um the concept of gems which is yeah. your you know, the, user facing uh, yeah um, the, 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 basically with any anything to do with token what what we're going through is getting regulatory approval in different parts of the world um obviously when we first designed the product uh, regulation was not very clear. Uh, for, for quite important part for us is ensure that um, users are coming on, you know, on board will, will eventually be KYC AML through. Right now, as you know, everything is purchased within the app, like the Google Google Play Store as well as the uh, Apple uh, payment system. So basically, it's like a gaming company. You come in, you purchase James, they take your credit card detail, everything just works inside that ecosystem. The complexity really start to come in, in which we have navigated the last eight months to work out the best possibility how people can withdraw their excess James or, um, mm-hmm. you know, we, we're navigating through all these. And there will be a lot of compliance issue. And we had uh, hire uh, compliance experts and uh, consultants to work in these areas. Um, the utility value, what we want to be bringing on to the um, the extra token holders more more in, in, in a different way where they can participate a, a, a bit more, a lot more with what they have on hand now, uh, whether in the NFT or maybe in the metaverse, give them access to special drops or early access things like that totally i can also see a world in which and, and this is someone who owns an only token uh you have to stake in order to, be able to get access to a special room or something like that right so you have to lock up your tokens for a certain period of time and um, and that there's you know and, and it just again right it, it's all about like how do you build a community and show skin of the game in a virtual like in a, in a trustless way um around the world so you you, you are correct um and yeah. you know we you know, this is basically our next um, quarter that we're putting together. And we have a thing called Master Collectors Program that's coming out 
and a lot of that will be part of that whole fundamental. Um, the collective program is very similar with what when you play uh, a, a card game in a shop, you you collect points, you you collect status. Um, we have some collectors out there um, you can see in the app they have thousands if you watch some of the YouTube I'm mind blown that how much collectible some individual own and you know all these will be part of that whole ecosystem um, as the master collective program roll out and a lot of the tokens will hopefully be somehow utilizing that there's, um, there's one final question here, uh, which also I'm really curious about, and it kind of goes back to your, why did you end up building a secure wallet in the first place? And um, uh, so uh, I struggle enough to get banking services in my bank, whatever, but like uh, the prospect of me turning up with my Spider-Man and saying, hey, can you can you custody this for me? I just think it's like obviously uh, not going to be a thing uh, for at least a little while. Um, but is there a, do you foresee that there is maybe an intersection where, uh, the existing world of DeFi and some sort of service services that emerge in that space, which can hold it, but then also do things like, hey, you've got a Spider-Man and someone wants to rent it to put it in some AR universe somewhere else in the world. Do you, are you open to renting it for some fee? Yeah. Uh, you know, do you see that there's going to be a future intersection for DeFi and? Um, yeah. So just bringing up that secure wallet. Um, so our secure wallet right now doesn't just hold digital currencies um, that also help you to hold your NFT inside as well. It's like a secure wallet that holds other NFT. That's on. Um, that, that's pretty much what you have in there if you can hold it in there. I think we have about 600 uh, type of NFT that you could uh, adopt in. Now, um, the problem where we, we, we are uh, right this moment is getting the license company in the studios to slowly understand that you know the interruptible um, environment where people do want to see that spider-man to be sent out um, and i do have to say a lot of them are very happy to see that what we as a company need to be uh, ensured is that our users are able to do it um, now i do have to say maybe 70, 80% of our customers right now are non-crypto users, okay? So you can't have a guy sit, you know, send out his Spider-Man and he lost it because he lost his private key. Um, we, we do not want to have people start reading us up and go, well, send out a secret rare comic. You know, that comic somehow didn't get to the address that I put in. And then we realize he put in the wrong address and go, well, you know, it just kind of didn't work or they got scanned. What we really want is more education. I think adoption, more and more people will be out there. The community will be supporting. That That will need to come in as well. So it's not just about the brand owner. It's about the user as well. We want user experiences, number one, that they don't feel uh, they're buying this thing and then they, they're going to lose their collectibles. Fantastic. Hmm. Excellent. Are there any... Any other questions? We've got about uh, we've got a couple of minutes left. All right. Well, David, I, I just want to, oh sorry, Nicholas. Yeah, yeah, go for it. Yeah. Uh, is it able uh, available to purchase as well in the other like NFT platforms such as OpenSea and those, or is it only in the app you can like buy them again? Um, so you're saying if we could, well, if we will allow the, like the now there, there's no possibility to buy any, right? If you want to buy one from another person that has it, can you do it through these platforms or you can only do it through? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Um, yes. So in the app, you can, we do have a marketplace as well uh, okay. right now. Uh, in about a few weeks time, we are launching our web-based version. So our web base uh, will allow you know you to navigate and look through the marketplace a lot easier. Uh, right now everything's functioning through the phone, so sometimes it can get a little bit overcluttered. So we are opening all that up in the web base coming up. Thanks a lot. Excellent. Fantastic. Um, awesome. Hey, well, um, thank you so much, David. I really appreciate this. This is like. Yeah, when I first came across it, I was like, "This story needs to be told." It's uh, it's such a kind of crazy, crazy tale of something that's um, built for New Zealand. I think you've done a, an amazing job uh, communicating that today. So, 
Um, look, I just want to say thank you so much from the Edmund Hillary Fellowship community. And what I'll do as well is um, there's a cut. If anybody here would like to get in contact, if you um, email me, I'm just oliver.bruce at gmail.com and then I'll facilitate an intro with, um, with David. Um, awesome. Thanks, Oliver. And thanks, David. It has been an amazing session, one of my favorites. It's nice to be able to listen to a session rather than having to host it. So thank you, Oliver, for stepping up and doing that one. And David, all the best. I've harvested a whole lot of stuff from the chat channel for you so that you can go through it. Fantastic. People want to help out. So I think okay. that's pretty cool. Yeah. Okay, thanks, so. team. Thanks so much. Thank you. Awesome. Cheers.